You're listening to Nurse Converse, presented by Nurse.org, a collaborative podcast amplifying diverse nurse voices. Get ready for a dose of inspiration, a sprinkle of education, and a whole lot of community. Hey, y'all, this is Leah, or Off the Clock Nurse on Instagram, and welcome to my episode on Nurse Converse. I want to thank everyone who voted for me to be in the top 10 for this podcast series. It truly means so much to me that I have this amazing group of support. But for those who don't know who I am, I want to give you a quick overview. I've been a nurse for 14 years, and I have tried out so many different specialties of nursing. So anything from floor nursing to operating room, travel nursing, remote work. But currently, I'm working as a forensic nurse examiner or sexual assault nurse examiner, and we tend to shorten it by saying f and SANE. And I've been working in this field coming up on three years next month, which is like, wow, time flies. But then when I think that I have like 30 years left uh, before I can retire, I don't feel like it's going fast enough. <laughs> but... As an f and SANE, I work with patients who have experienced sexual assault, domestic violence, strangulation, and human sex trafficking. So I do want to give a huge trigger warning for this episode because I will be talking about sexual assault, domestic violence, strangulation, and human sex trafficking, um, along with pornography. And this is across all ages. So at my hospital where I work, I work with patients of all ages. And this is a very tough topic to talk about, but it's so needed, especially in healthcare. So if you need to take a break or decide that this just isn't for you, I totally understand. But I I hope that you can stick it out with me here because there's going to be a lot of really good information. Now, this episode is only 30 minutes long, but sexual assault, intimate partner violence, and human trafficking have been happening since the beginning of time, so I quite literally have endless topics to talk about. So if you want to hear more or if you find this episode interesting, please give it a review on whatever platform you're using to um, listen to this series. So, okay, let's get into it. It's January. And January is Human Trafficking Awareness Month. And there are many types of trafficking, but I'm going to be talking about human sex trafficking since those are the patients that I work with. So what is human sex trafficking? In general, the thought when talking about it, um, human sex trafficking, is that it happens only or mostly in other countries. Um, where a young girl is snatched off the streets, or um, I've seen those TikToks where they're giving a, a warning that someone's tying ribbons around the car door handles at a Target parking lot and to be alert because somebody's going to grab you. And while this can happen, it's not the most common forms of someone being trapped in trafficking. So when we are trying to understand the federal laws surrounding human sex trafficking, we use the AMP model or the AMP model. And this is action, means, and purpose. So that means um, it's the action of someone who recruits, harbors, transports, provides, or obtains another person by means of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of commercial sex acts. At the federal level, a victim under the age of 18 does not need to prove force, fraud, or coercion. However, at the state level, some of the states decide to do things differently. So in 15 states, it is required for someone under the age of 18 to prove force, fraud, or coercion. And I'm going to explain why this is an issue in just a minute here. So stick with me. So let's talk about statistics a little bit. And I love to give statistics because I think it really draws a good picture on just how large the scope of the problem is right here in the United States. So an estimate given by the National Human Trafficking Hotline and Hope for uh, Justice says that there are more than 1 million victims trapped in human trafficking here in the United States. 
there's no way to tell the exact number since there is a lack of consistency in reporting and definitions throughout the United States. So this is where the issue of having to prove force, fraud, or coercion comes in. In the instance where the victim is not able to prove those, or they are too scared to tell on their trafficker, they go from being labeled as a victim of human trafficking, but to instead being placed in jail or prison for prostitution. So not only were they abused by these traffickers and buyers, but they end up being abused by the very system that is supposed to be saving them. So now let's look at the Bureau of Justice Statistics. In a group of 1,169 defendants charged in the United States for human trafficking in 2020, 92% were male, 63% were white, 18 black, 17 Hispanic, and 95% were U.S. citizens. And here's the kicker, 66% had no prior convictions. And that just goes to show you how well these traffickers stay under the radar. So going back to the myth of people who are trafficked are snatched off the streets, 91% of human trafficking victims are actually trafficked by somebody that they know. This could be a family member, a friend, a friend of the family, so your church pastor or priest or your sport, sports coach or someone you met through an online gaming community. But most commonly, it'll be a boyfriend or significant other. For child sex trafficking, 42% of child trafficking victims were actually sold by their own parents. So I think it's really important to talk about who are the actual traffickers. So there is this myth, another myth that says 100% are male that are traffickers and the victims are always female. And it's important to remember that a trafficker can be anyone. It does not matter their gender, race, so socioeconomic status, or even their age. Some adult traffickers will recruit other vulnerable teens to bring in their friends to be trafficked. And in return, they give payment and are not the ones that always have to get sex trafficked. So they manipulate these teens into believing that they aren't um, doing anything wrong, that in fact, they are helping their friends by also getting them paid. So this is just one form of grooming. So talking about the grooming process, we hear this term being thrown around a lot over the last few years. And grooming for human sex trafficking often doesn't happen quickly. We think trafficking as something that's very violent or a victim being grabbed and beaten into submission. And while this can happen, it's not often that it starts off that way. So often a trafficker will start uh, with psychological manipulation tactics to lure their victims in. If it is someone that the victim knows, um, they could be the fun, trusted, caring person that you would never expect to do something like this to your child or anyone else. Um, they make their way in by pinpointing someone that they can tell is a vulnerable victim someone that maybe has low self-esteem, has um, experienced a lot of trauma in their life. Um, if it's a child, maybe someone who is scared of getting in trouble. Um, so I like to give the example of the boyfriend tactic. So this is where a guy will lure in their victim by making everything seem like a regular re romantic relationship. They're very good at listening and being able to figure out what that victim is missing in their life. And it can be anything from food or new clothing to financial help with bills to drugs and alcohol to emotionally um, manipulate by fulfilling the victim's need for love and belonging. 
And while love and belonging are not things that we technically need for survival, like food or water, they are things that people will do anything for just so that they don't lose that feeling. It's the same thing that goes for addiction. We often look at the bad things that drugs and alcohol do to a person, but when you ask an addict, somebody who's addicted to drugs or alcohol, how do they feel when they are taking the drugs? They'll say things like, well, I, it makes me feel numb or it makes me feel good or calm. And if we really want to help a person with the addiction, we need to learn to address the cause of the addiction and not just focus on the addiction itself. So why do they feel numb? Why is feeling numb when you are high better than whatever you're feeling when you're not? What is missing from your life that you need to turn to this drug to feel a sense of calm or feel good that is not happening in your everyday life? And that is exactly what these traffickers focus on with their victims, especially the ones that they get addicted to drugs or alcohol. So. I remember this quote from a former pimp on this human trafficking documentary that I was watching. And he said, you take away everything she has and only give her what she needs. You, the pimp, are the cause as well as the solution to all of her problems. You give her the poison and then sell her the cure. With that in mind, the trafficker now has power and control over their victim. So this is when he starts to force her to do things that she doesn't want to do. Um, he either threatens her or goes further and tries to normalize it. So let's say uh, this victim has been sexually assaulted by her stepdad at home, random scenario, and she's a runaway teen. The trafficker might say things like, well, you were having sex at home and weren't getting anything for it. At least I'm giving you all of these nice things and making sure that you're being taken care of. So it's just normalizing, justifying is the way of their game. Now, why does, why does human trafficking exist? Because to the layman person, you know, someone who's not doing those things, we're like, this is terrible. Why would anybody do this? Well, according to the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, the human trafficking market between 2020 and 2021 is estimated to be around a $150 billion industry. This makes it the second most lucrative black market behind the illegal drug trade. And we know there are bad people all around us. These traffickers are not just regular annoying bad people that maybe take up multiple parking spots or don't pick up after their dogs, you know, their poop. Um, these are actual narcissistic people who are driven by power, control, and greed. The traffickers are not just those who hang out at abandoned houses, but many of them have been very rich and well-known figures throughout our society, um, including people in our own police departments, our government officials, who are whose very job are to protect the community and create laws surrounding these atrocities. So they are people who don't believe that laws actually apply to them and that they are literally untouchable. And as a society, we are complicit in allowing them to get away with it, with trafficking. We live in a country where we blame, shame, and don't believe victims when they come forward. And we have this mentality that if it hasn't happened to me, or I don't personally know somebody that I care about that it's happened to, then it doesn't really matter, or that it's rare, it's a, it's a rare occurrence, or even worse, it's easier for us to believe that the victim is lying than accept, that the, accept the fact that we live in this world where human sex trafficking actually exists, and it's happening in our very own neighborhoods. 
we saw this whole thing unfold with the Jeff Jeffrey Epstein case. And if you don't know about that case, then I recommend that you find one of the many documentaries about Epstein that are on Netflix right now and really listen to the survivors speak their truth. Because Jeffrey Epstein was linked to some of the most powerful and famous people in the world. I'm talking Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, uh, Sergey Brin, who's the co-founder of Google, Bill Gates, the director of the CIA, William Burns, and freaking Prince Andrew, the son of Queen Elizabeth. May she rest in peace, but not too much peace. These people have never been convicted, but you cannot tell me that these high-profile people who flew in his jet and spent time with Epstein on his private island never heard the rumors about Epstein and didn't think that it was weird that he always had these underage girls surrounding him. Another way that we're complicit in feeding the human sex trafficking line is by normalizing it. We have given it another name. We've, even in some places like Las Vegas, we've legalized it. We call it prostitution or sex work. And now many people will say, now there may be some people who choose to do sex work and it not because they can't find anything else to do or that they don't believe that they are, are worthy of anything else. These are typically Caucasian women of high socioeconomic status who actually work within the porn industry, and they have full bodily autonomy over what they will and won't do in these pornos, and they are adequately compensated for their job. So you might say, well, Leah, if prostitution is legal, then the victims won't get arrested and sent to jail. And that's the issue you previously talked about. And to that, I say, they have not helped true victims of human sex trafficking. They've just made it easier for traffickers to exploit them and get away with it. If it was truly about helping victims instead of making prostitution legal or arresting those who cannot prove forced fraud or coercion, they should instead offer rehabilitation and resources to those who want it. I want to talk about the link between human sex trafficking and pornography. Now, just like not all traffickers are men, not all buyers are men either, but the vast majority of both are men. So, to explain this, I'm sorry, not sorry, guys, but I am pointing the finger. When it comes to pornography, often just watching it isn't enough. There's this escalation need to act out what is being shown in this porno, and people can do that if they have money. Apparently, this is something men are very willing to pay for. If there wasn't such a high demand for sex trafficking, we're billions of dollars could be made, then there wouldn't be a need for a supply. And when I use, I'm using bunny ears when I'm saying the word supply, because that supply is an actual human being with feelings, needs, and a desire for a better and different life. They have just been conditioned to believe that a better life will never be achievable. So my final statement before I hop off this soapbox and onto my next soapbox is to say, this is my own opinion now, if a person says nothing, knowing that there was trafficking, a trafficking situation going on, or if they have paid to participate in a sex act and not knowing fully to the fullest extent that that person is not a victim of human sex trafficking, then they are just as guilty as the actual trafficker. I wrote here in my notes to take a deep breath. So let's just do it all together. Okay. So now you have a very, very shortened overview of human trafficking. There's so much more to it. But the question is, how do I apply this to the healthcare field? 
And while all healthcare workers should know this, and I'm looking at you, ER staff, STD clinics, urgent care clinics, pediatric office staff, everybody should know this. So what are some signs that you should be looking for? Well, they will often, and I'm talking about the, the victims when they come in as your patients, they were often not be alone. Most often they're going to be with either their seller or sometimes another person who is being trafficked um, is going to be with them. And you're like, well, why wouldn't they both speak up? And it's because sometimes this other person is also brainwashed into believing that if they bring this patient back, bring this victim back, that uh, without being found out, that they will be rewarded or maybe they're a closer person to that trafficker and they think that they're in more control than what they actually are. Another sign is uh, this other person will be the one answering questions or maybe holding on to the patient's ID. The patient might have multiple untreated STDs or a new HIV diagnosis. The patient doesn't make eye contact and rarely speaks for themselves. The patient might not know what state they're in. A big thing within human trafficking rings is that they often will move their victims around. And this is so that they're not staying in one place for too long in order to make friends or get to know the area well enough in order to run away. So many um, have started going away from the branding tattoos, but if you do see something that is questionable, like some weird, weird tattoo, because let's be honest, uh, we've all made questionable choices in getting tattoos. If you see one, it's good to just ask. Everybody has a funny story or some kind of story to a tattoo. Um, even if it's just like, oh, that was just on a whim. So asking them, oh, what's the story behind that? And if they get really nervous or they cannot tell you, then it might be something to look into more. So what should you do if you suspect your patient um, is in human trafficking? We try our best to separate them from the person they're with. And this could mean taking them for a test. Um, it could be saying, oh, it's protocol or policy. We just have to ask these alone. Um, but somehow getting them by themselves in order to ask them um, if they're if they're okay. And I would say something like, I don't want to make assumptions, but I just want to ask because I care and I will believe whatever you tell me. But based off of these things, and you can list the reasons why you're suspecting it, that they're in um, human trafficking, you can say something like, I want to ask if you're in any danger. Is someone making you do something that you don't want to do or threatening you? physically or psychologically? Are they abusing you? And I wouldn't just blindly come out and say, hey, are you in human trafficking? Because a lot of them don't even know that what that means. They don't believe that they're in human trafficking. They've been taught that it's just something, these acts that they're being made to do is just normal. It's just something that's normal. So if they answer yes, then make sure you're notifying hospital security that you are letting your charge nurse know you're getting social work involved. They're calling the local police. And if there is not an advocacy group in the area, make, seeing if the police department has their own advocate that can come and be with this patient. Let's also not forget that along with safety, we want to prioritize this patient's medical and psychological well-being. So they obviously were coming into an emergency room for some purpose, and we want to find out why they were there to begin with. Now, what if they say no, um, they're not being trafficked and everything is fine, but like, what's that, what's that saying? I may have been born at night, but I wasn't born last night type of obvious Remember that these patients' entire lives revolves around their seller or their trafficker. They rely on them for every aspect of life, food, shelter, clothing, and even sometimes a sense of community with being surrounded by other trafficked victims. So they could have been threatened, 
that if they said anything, that one of their friends would be hurt or killed. And losing their life, their friend's life, or ending up on the streets alone are all very realistic fears. So don't push them. Once they give their answer, just say something like, oh, okay, I understand. We're always trying to get information out there. So if you know anyone that is in a trafficking situation, you can tell them that this is always a safe place for them to come and let a staff member know. Or I do have this phone number if you don't mind taking it. And sometimes they'll, <laughs> I personally have yet to have someone turn me down to take this phone number. And even when we were looking, working, I was working at this nurse advice line, um, we would send emails that uh, looked like spam emails that would require a password to open. And I just thought that was really cool because I wish we had that on all of our computers. Actually, maybe that's something that I'll harass um, hospital management about next. But uh, it was really cool because that way, if a trafficker were to take their phone and go through it, then it's not something that would pop out to them as being like, oh, why do you have this number or uh, you're in trouble now? So other things that your hospital can do, there's something that I was recently able to accomplish at my hospital that I'm super proud of. The bathroom is one place that a person can be alone sitting on a toilet and having flyers up in the bathroom stalls uh, with advocacy phone numbers not only allows that person to know that they're not alone, but that this hospital that they're at cares about this topic and is aware of the problem. So it's very easy to generate a QR code that the patient can take a photo of and visit later uh, that has all of the advocacy phone numbers on as well. So it's not as obvious if their trafficker is like going through their phone, especially with restaurants or other places that are making it more normal to use QR codes. So when a patient comes in, we always go through those admission questions and it's those like safety questions. Do you feel safe at home? Make sure you're asking those by themselves, because even if they're coming in with family or friends, um, and let's say it's a domestic violence, like it's a, their trafficker is a boyfriend, mm -hmm. we want to make sure that we are not asking them those questions in front of anybody else, because there's so much surrounding shame and embarrassment to admit in front of even people who aren't their trafficker, that they are in these situations. In clinics or ERs, whenever you have to collect a urine sample, maybe putting a cup with stickers in the bathrooms with a directions that says, if you are in immediate crisis or immediate need for help in one of these trafficking or abusive situations, just put a sticker on the cup and that will alert the healthcare worker to know that they need to se now separate the people that are in the room. But Overall, I think having a set hospital protocol to know what to do if someone does ask for help, going in, asking open-ended questions, non-judgmental questions, and most importantly, to start by believing those who do come forward is most important. You made it to the end. <laughs> I applaud you and thank you for sticking with me. If you would like to learn more about human trafficking, uh, I am helping to put together a human trafficking prevention program called Walking Wise. It's dedicated to helping adults hold candid conversations with young people about child sex trafficking. And the mission is to teach uh, kids how to recognize sexual exploitation and report it. So this is made also for medical professionals, school educators, and parents um, can enroll at walkingwise.com to participate in the online um, series. And it covers 11 diverse topics relating to sex trafficking. It's a comprehensive curriculum that offers explainer style animated videos designed for kids and training for adults. And it includes lesson plans um, for classrooms and presentations. I will announce when it officially goes live from my Instagram, Off the Clock Nurse, or my Facebook page, Off the Clock Nurse Travels. And of course, if you or someone you know is being human trafficked or in a human trafficking situation, 
please reach out to the National Human Trafficking Hotline at 1-888-373-7888, or you can text INFO in all caps to 233733. Thank you guys again for listening. Don't forget to leave me a review on whichever platform you are streaming and deep breaths and have a great, wonderful rest of your day. Thanks for joining Nurse Converse, brought to you by nurse.org. Help us grow by leaving a five-star rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. Nurse.org supports nurses with career and education tips, life advice, and breaking news. Thank you for all you do and for being you. 